So while Danny's getting his talk up, I'll give him an introduction. So um, this is another third year talk. I think there's a slight difference that Danny apparently has a fourth year of funding. Um, <laughs> so he's got a little bit of extra time ahead of him, which is always nice to have. Um, Danny's uh, supervised jointly, really. He's, uh, he's funded by Queen's and also by a university in Canada. His supervisor, primary supervisor here in Queen's is Jamie. And um, before coming to Queen's, he worked for NIA for four years, doing marine monitoring. Um, and he's now working on invasive species. He's going to talk about understanding the impact um, biological invasions and consumer, consumer resource interactions. Thanks, Alison. Yeah, uh, that seems like a fairly complicated title, but really what I've been doing for three years is putting animals in pots and seeing how much they eat, just to ground this talk in a bit of reality before we take off. I'm going to break from convention a little bit and just race into a couple of definitions, just so we all know what I'm talking about over the course of this presentation. <clears throat> the first one is defining uh, interactions uh, between species. We usually think of interactions between species in terms of their functional response, which is quite simply the relationship for a predator and its prey between prey consumption and the density of those prey. Um, and these FRs take three broad forms. Type 1 to linear, uh, essentially um, we can regard the uh, slope to be the attack rate of the predator. And these are sort of a special case uh, because, um, and they're supposed to be specific to filter feeders, because filter feeders don't need to handle their prey like you and me, they just suck it in. Um, everyone else um, really needs to handle their prey, we need to hold it, manipulate it, digest, ingest, and that leads to handling limited function responses. Uh, they are far more common, we see this as a type 2 here, and the handling limitation results in saturation of those feeding rates at high densities and the attack rates to find the bottom part of the curve. In contrast to type 3, we see a similar saturation of those feeding rates at high densities, uh, but there's a crucial difference, and it's the inflection at low densities that we see. Um, and that inflection is regarded to uh, impart stability to predator-prey dynamics, at least in theory. And that's a, a difference I'll come back to a number of times over the talk. It's worth noting at this point that my talk is predator-prey focused, but in principle, these sorts of interactions can be applied to any biological utilization of a resource. Second definition, um, I need to uh, define what we mean by impact in invasion ecology. And to do this, I'm going to embark on a relatively tenuous analogy and imaginary pond food web, uh, populated by uh, a number of uh, bottom feeding species that may have co-evolved with each other over long periods of time and have well-defined interactions with each other. One day you have a look in this pond and you're like, wow, this pond is, is full of Nigel Farage. <laughs> um, and you might jump to the conclusion that because this pond is full of Nigel Farage, that Nigel Farage is having an impact. And that's a mistake, because really to understand the impact of Nigel Farage, we need to understand his per capita interactions with those other community members. And that's where the functional response comes in. It allows us to define those interactions. The second point about uh, defining impact is there's often a value judgment associated with it. We may think that uh, impact is a negative thing um, because, for example, uh, Nigel is eating all our native clays, um, or perhaps uh, Nigel is a valuable fish species. So, as ecologists, we need to stick to talking about change rather than the direction of that change when we talk about impact in ecosystems. Of course, <coughs> real food webs are very complicated, even quite simple. Or... Yeah, even quite simple or uh, species deportate uh, food webs have many uh, pairwise interactions. Is that working? Yeah. So um, we can't hope to define all of these interactions, but there is some hope because. Uh, we can restrict our inquiry to uh, certain size classes of species because we know that body size constrains interaction strength. And secondly, we know that the shapes I mentioned of those interactions have important consequences for stability. Uh, this is a, a graph by Williams and Martinez, and it really shows the bottom part of a couple of functional response curves. And 
They show using uh, simple food webs that the difference between shapes that promote extinction and those that promote coexistence are very slight. You might rather be skeptical about that um, and how that translates to real food webs. I know I am a little bit. Nonetheless, it's something worth bearing in mind. General methods, because I've been doing FRs really exclusively for the past three years, so I'm not going to repeat myself four times over. We tend to starve our predators to standardise their hunger. We tend to introduce a single predator into an arena containing a, one of a range of prey densities and run our trials for about 24 hours. And we determine the function response type. Is it a one, is it a two, is it a three? And we can fit a flexible model alternatively that can handle all of those shapes. And then we can bootstrap the data uh, to get 95% uh, confidence, interval, confidence intervals of entire FR curves and their associated parameters. I've been looking at Pontocaspian species, two in particular have become very successful invaders of the Shannon. Um, firstly, Helicoratium curve spinum over on the right there, a tubiculus amphipod, a basal consumer, a filter feeder, and its interactions with intermediate and higher predators. And secondly, Hemimysis animala, the mitis shrimp, and its interactions with basal consumers and also how those are mediated by higher predators. I'm going to talk first of all about the work I've been doing with hemimysis, I did two bits of work with hemimysis. Um, and the first thing I really want to do was to build on some of the work that Jamie has done with hemimysis uh, on the individual function responses of hemimysis and a native equivalent towards um, prey populations. And that's uh, very much in line with uh, the majority of FR uh, studies that we see, it's individual predators on uh, prey resources. And that really, uh, the implication of that is that we can um, anticipate what the population level impacts of these sorts of animals are from their individual level impacts. But of course that slightly neglects the fact that these uh, mitres may interact with each other, uh, they may facilitate or suppress uh, their overall foraging activity. So we may get what is known as an emergent multiple predator effect, one which can't be predicted from multiplying out the effects of individuals. And it becomes more difficult to understand if we bring a high predator into the picture because, first and foremost, that high predator will perhaps attack and consume the basal resource. Um, and we might therefore predict the net effect on that basal resource from the addition of all of those individual predators. But that neglects the obvious point, which is that high predator will interact directly with the intermediates. It will attack and consume them, it will alter their behaviour. Uh, either way, those can cause cascading effects down to the basal resource. Either, they're either density mediated or trait mediated. So I wanted to understand this uh, in a kind of FR framework. And to do this, we used hemimysis um, and a native equivalent here, mysis salami, and asked whether essentially, in terms of experimental treatments, whether the FR of an individual mysid multiplied by three uh, predicted the FR of a group of three mysids foraging together, and then whether the FR of those three mice added to the FR of a stickleback predicted what happens when all of these guys forage together and what happens when we change the uh, mice from an invader to a native. We use Daphne and Magna as a basal prey uh, in these experiments simply because it's, it's very easy to culture and quite representative I think. Just to key you into uh, the general theme of uh, the graphs here, uh, all of my plots are prey consumption on the Y versus prey density on the X, unless I uh, state otherwise, and I refer to the invaders in red and the natives in blue. Here what we're looking at is the predicted FR of groups of three mycids based on the individual FR multiplied by three. And if we overlay the actual FRs, what we see is those confidence intervals overlap throughout, so there's no emergent effect occurring in trust specifically. It's worth noting though that the FR of the groups of invaders were higher than the FR of the groups of natives, except at very high densities. So when we add a high predator into this uh, prediction, these are now the predicted FRs for these mixtures. What we see for the invasive mixture is that there is again no emergent effect uh, because those confidence intervals overlap throughout. In contrast, there is an emergent effect for the native mixture, and it's one of risk reduction, our actual FR is lower than our predicted FR. And that has the overall effect of increasing the difference in impact between the natives and the invaders. Well, why is that the case? Well, we can, it's worth noting first and foremost that it's not because the stickleback consumed all of the natives 
and that was that, because it preferred them because we replaced those mice as they were consumed by the high pressure over the course of this experiment. And it's not because either of those mice was more vulnerable to predation by the higher predator. So the stickleback was, uh, didn't favor one or the other. And there was no relationship between uh, the density of the basal prey and the vulnerability of those mice uh, to predation. So we can speculate with good reason that this is a um, it's predator avoidance behavior on the part of the native, but not on the part of the invader. Before I conclude for hemimysis, I will go for my next experiment and then conclude all at once. These next set of experiments were about moving uh, these FRs that we frequently do in the lab um, out into the field and asking whether the FRs that we see in the lab bear any resemblance to the FRs that we see in the field, given that in the field we have multiple cues and important contexts which may impinge on those interactions. Uh, and for mice in particular, uh, one of the most important things is their uh, habit of undergoing something called diurnal vertical migration, DVM, which is this. Essentially, we find that the mice aggregate on the bottom of locks uh, during the day and then swarm up into the water column at night. We find that the uh, invaders tend to uh, swarm more inshore uh, and the uh, natives tend to distribute more evenly throughout the water column. Um, it's quite a complicated picture all in all, and the only thing that seems certain is that they return to the bottom in the day, or at least they associate with the benthos, and more often that is the deep benthos, but it can be the shallow too. So it's just a general pattern. Um, and I want to do in situ experiments which reflected this distribution. So I built a load of arrays like this and uh, bung them into the water on uh, vertically buoyed lines. And we use Loch Derg down on the Shannon um, to do this uh, at a site close to the deepest part of the loch, um, one site inshore in three metres of water and one site offshore in uh, 22 metres of water. And this is what the schematic looks like um, in the night. And I have a few symbols here to key you into the upcoming plots. So we have on the top left, inshore on the surface at night and then offshore on the surface at night and then offshore on the bottom at night. We ran the trials for six hours and uh, again Daphne and Magna were the prey um, and six hours was the longest time to get consistent lighting levels for. And then in the day the deployment went like this, inshore on the bottom, offshore on the bottom. So here are the results and what we have here is just the night plot uh, and it's clear across the board that the invader consumes more than the native and this is particularly noticeable inshore on the surface at night, that is the top left plot. Still there, uh, offshore, and in the day, what we find is uh, either little or no difference uh, between uh, native and invasive FRs. Um, and we can look at the uh, particular parameters of the function responses to tease out the subtle differences, um, but uh, a decent way to get a rough handle on what's really going on is to just do a rough and ready GLM on numbers eaten by array location, and we find for the uh, native we can remove that factor array location from the minimum GLM, and that really tells us that there's very little variation in the FRs of the natives over their DVM cycle. Uh, in contrast, we have to keep that factor in uh, for our minimum GLM for the invader. And again, if you use post hocs and look at the particular parameters, what, what it's really telling you is that, that is because the invader is reducing its consumption on the bottom in the daytime to levels that are, that are more akin to that of the native and then increasing at night, particularly inshore on the surface. So the impacts of the invader are both higher and more asymmetric over that cycle than the impacts of the native. Take on points for the uh, uh, work with hemimysis. FRs are useful for quantifying intra and interspecific conversion effects and understanding how these per capita effects may translate to impact. And also, understanding how demographic rates vary over spatial temporal scales is, is a fundamental challenge in ecology, and function responses can really help us here because we can do experiments at specific places and at specific points in time and tease out some subtle differences which may be important for community dynamics, etc. Second bit of work, uh, working with this little guy, Keir Gray from Kirby Spine, another successful invader of the Shannon from the Ponte Caspian region. Uh, probably the most numerically dominant invertebrate on the Shannon, I would say. Um, just a hunch. Um, and one thing that you notice about Chelicorathium um, when you were within a lab is it likes to get its back against the wall, likes to hide in all the nooks and crannies. Um, I don't think that makes it unique for a small invertebrate, but it's something worth asking questions of using FRs. 
Um, the second thing about Achilles Corathium is that it uh, has a defensive trait, it constructs mud tubes. Uh, and so what I really wanted to do with Achilles Corathium was ask how these traits affected the success of its potential predators in our resident lacustrine system here in Ireland. With regard to the first question, how does habitat structure mediate predator-prey interactions? Seems like a simple question, um, and often the way people go about answering this in the literature is to take a treatment, an arena with nothing in it, and an arena with some rocks thrown in, and then inoculate those arenas with prey, and fire in a predator, and see what happens. That's all well and good, and in fact I've done this kind of experiment. It can tell you that habitat structure has an effect, but it can't tell you why and that is because there are a number of differences between A and B. Namely, in B, there's high surface area, there's low volume perhaps, um, there's the presence of spatial refugia perhaps, there may be some camouflaging and obstruction of predator-prey movement. So, in order to find out why structure might mediate these interactions, you need to move away from the tendency to, or I think at least, move away from the tendency to use these natural structures like uh, bivalves, macrophytes, etc., and isolate um, one particular variable using artificial structures where you can precisely manipulate things like uh, available refuge and hold all of the factors as constant as you can. So I chose to look at spatial refugia. And I did this by basically constructing a load of arenas from straws driven into white tack and manipulating the distances between those straws. Um, I'll show you a schematic of them here. We use Gammarus dubini and Gammarus pulex, uh, uh, basically in, uh, native and invasive uh, resident agrobot predators, to look at this particular uh, FI relationship. And what we did was we altered uh, the internode distances between those straws to create refuge space. So moving from A through to C is an increase in available predator free space, where in A we have a uniform grid uh, where predators and prey can move throughout that arena. In B, we have four small areas of refuge, and in C, we have one large area. And those symbols on the right should key you into the upcoming plots, open symbols, half and half, and filled, respectively. So, these are the results. Remember, red is the invader, blue is the native. Moving from very little or no predator-free space through to more predator-free space, left to right, we see the first thing you notice is that there's a systematic decrease or decline in the magnitude of those functional responses with increasing predator-free space, but also, perhaps more importantly, if you believe the likes of Williams and Martinez, there is a systematic change from an absolute type 2 over on the left through to more type 3 over on the right. And if you look at the FR parameters, uh, I'd just like to highlight a few particular trends um, that we can see in those. So if you draw your attention to the top two plots to begin with, and these are the search coefficients, the attack rates, remember, in a linear FR, the attack rate is just the slope. So we can see that um, attack rates tend to decline with increasing predator-free space. Handling times, the next two down, tend to lengthen with increasing predator-free space. And the scaling exponent, which defines the shape of the FR, where zero is an absolute type two, and more than zero is increasingly type three, tend to ever so slightly increase. I'm not gonna be so bold as to try to fit something like a linear model to all those, that'd be silly but I'm just uh, suggesting that there are some systematic differences that may not be different from each other in terms of significantly different from each other on a pair-by-pair -pair basis, but do combine to yield FRs which are different from each other. Uh, these are the highest um, available for predator-free space treatments versus no predator-free space. We can see that yes, the magnitude is reduced, but also crucially at low prey densities, we have that inflection which results in clear water between the uh, top and bottom FRs, respectively, for each native and invasive plot. Okay, last set of experiments, and again I'll talk about these two sets of experiments I did with Keely Corathium and then conclude all together. This set of experiments is really about community level interaction patterns. We know that functional response parameters uh, scale with predator prey body mass ratios. Uh, and if you just to key into the predator prey body mass ratio thing, a small ratio is where the predator is similar in size to the prey, and a large ratio is where the predator is much bigger than the prey. So, we know from the literature that handling times tend to decline with increasing ratios, and far more tenuously, I think, there is some evidence to suggest that 
the type 3-ness, the scaling exponent, should increase with increasing predator size, essentially. Um, I've never seen that uh, plotted. Um, I've only seen it hinted at with these sort of conceptual plots. Um, so I'm, I'm skeptical about that one. Um, however, this one is something of a universal law of local scale predator prey interactions, and it is this hump shaped distribution of tap rates with increasing uh, predator prey body mass ratios, such that there is some optimum and smaller and larger predators do less well. Okay. And here's some humps. So, do the defensive traits, i.e. tube building and habitat structure, i.e. some rocks, alter those community level patterns of predation towards kilocrate? Three experimental treatments. Over on the left, we have undefended free swimming prey. In the middle, we have prey defended in mud tubes. And on the right, we have prey defended in mud tubes and amongst some rocks. And we used uh, 17 size predator combinations across six species to do this work. Uh, from the very smallest, uh, gammas that were almost the same size as Keeley, through to brown trout with ratios of well over 1,000, um, covering a few orders of magnitude there. Uh, three spines stuck back and nine spines in between, as well as different size classes of amphipods and hemimysis were used. So, these are the results. Uh, so what we're looking at here is handling times on the Y and body mass ratios on the X. And the purple dots are the undefended prey, the uh, prey defended in tubes are orange dots, and the prey defended in tubes amongst stones are the green dots. You can do non-linear and covert and decide that you can get rid of those contexts and lump all the data together um, and then fit a negative exponential function to those data. Um, it's not overly surprising that context doesn't really alter handling times because handling times are supposed to be grounded in the physiological limitations of those predators and that, that's grounded in their size ultimately. When we move on to Q, the scaling exponent or the threeness, um, and there's some suggestion of a, a negative trend which is opposite to the kind of uh, conceptual plots that I've seen. I wouldn't like to um, hang my hat on it. Um, you can remove context again and lump the data if you like. I'm not suggesting that these are even great models to fit, there's no even mechanistic reason for me to do so. Um, so I'm happy to leave that question open and maybe suggest that maybe there isn't so much of a systematic trend of uh, scaling exponents with body mass ratios. Finally, really to the meat of the findings I think, uh, if you look at attack rates, it's clear that the contexts really alter those relationships to some degree. And what we can do is we can fit context specific uh, generalized Ricker functions to those two uh, data series, which are the undefended free swimming prey in purple and the prey in tubes in orange. Okay, and what we can do here is just point out a few things. Uh, first is that um, the optimum attack rate uh, is reduced on account of tubes, and also the optimum body mass ratio um, is upshifted. So that is because essentially the smaller predators do less well on the defended prey. And in fact, that difference disappears or even inverts for larger predators because those larger predators are eating entire prey, tubes and all, um, and they can't escape once they've sort of set up shop. And really surprisingly, and a result that really contravenes all of the established literature on this subject, um, we don't see any hump shape when we include context. We see something more akin to a shallow power law relationship. So uh, the context of habitat structure has totally collapsed that hump shape distribution of attack rates. And that must have some really interesting consequences for the success of this particular species, but I think more generally points to the importance of habitat structure in mediating these sorts of interactions. Take-home points for Keeley. Habitats with superficially similar complexity can provide varying amounts of predator-free space, and that's potentially vital for the persistence of prey populations, but because we know that real FR data is so noisy, real predation is so noisy and variable, do those fine scale differences in shape really matter? I think that's a valid question to ask. Uh, secondly, uh, the adaptive significance of defensive traits should be considered allometrically in terms of body mass ratios uh, because of those defensive ability trade-offs I was talking about. What I mean by that is that uh, the, the very largest predators, uh, the stronger interactors, and they may be disproportionately successful at uh, consuming defended prey, for example, crabs or mussels, um, 
But those predators are so rare relative to the smaller predators, they are not the ones which are driving the, these adaptive traits to emerge. Um, so I think that's quite a kind of interesting aside, if you like, from the whole invasion story. Habitat structure can have dramatic consequences for the scaling of those, protect, uh, those predator attack rates. Uh, asking the question what are the resulting effects on community dynamics is something I hope to be doing over the next year, amongst other things. And that leads me nicely into some general conclusions. So beyond the study system, FRs uh, fundamentally define how energy is transferred through food webs, so they have uh, a certain use um, in that sense. Um, and FRs have many potential applications, particularly in invasion biology, but also in ecology uh, at large. And because they're easily and rapidly quantifiable, that aspect of uh, discerning interactions at different scales, at different places and different times, I think is a very valuable um, piece of, uh, a very valuable aspect of doing FR studies. And although quantifying every pairwise FR and food web is a massive task, large data sets can yield valuable information. Um, and surprisingly, that study I showed you last uh, turns out to be the biggest single empirical FR study um, that's been done to date that I can find, and it's not even that big. And it, it's highlighted some interesting things. So I think the process of accruing a lot of these sorts of uh, data will tell us a lot about how um, invasives are successful and how other things operate in ecosystems. And I'd like to finish by saying that I've really had great fun over the past three years doing this sort of work because it's been a bit of a childish diversion. I've kind of enjoyed putting animals in pots and uh, looking at what they do and harassing them a bit, which every kid loves to do. Uh, and if you don't believe me, there's a picture of my daughter <laughs> doing just that. Thank you. Questions? Are you able to separate the effects of predator identity from your uh, body size ratio to mass It's a good question. I think I tried really hard to do that. Um, there's a lot of overlap between my size classes, but ultimately um, we're looking at uh, the commonest species in a lacustrine system there. And for example, there's an inevitable. Uh, uh, invertebrate to vertebrate switch over as we go bigger. I could have like, I, 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 often I used um, dragonfly nymphs uh, just because I wanted a really big invertebrate uh, to mix it up a bit, but it's a bit silly because they're only in, you only find them in random little ponds here and there and they're very rare. So really the reality of those scaling relationships um, could be quite closely tied to those predator identities and quite uh, local and system specific. So. People have been criticised in the past um, for not separating predator identity um, from body size when they do these sorts of experiments, but to some extent it's surprisingly difficult to do because these things, I think, if you believe any of the niche-based stuff, then they tend to separate out species by size to some degree. Um, you don't often have the luxury of uh, eliminating predator identity. But good question. More questions? Okay, I have been, but it's not really very um, specific to your, your chapters. It's, what's the biggest thing that's gone wrong in your PhD? Because to me, this seems to have worked out quite well. You've got a big body of data. Oh, there's, a, there's a litany of things. I put a load of uh, tanks on the roof at one point um, to try and do mesocosm studies, and they all, well, I think someone blew off the roof actually. So. That's a pretty, pretty yeah. big problem. Yeah, there's definitely a lot that's gone wrong that you just, I just haven't uh, bothered. Talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, you seem to overcome it very well. And the second question is, what are you going to do in fourth year? Um, um, well, we've got some interesting genetic basis <laughs> of invasion stuff to do, and I'll be doing some uh, green crab FRs, uh, sort of internationally with Mary, uh, who some of you know, I think, uh, one of Jamie's PhD students, and a few guys over in North America. So I'll have plenty to do. It's not just writing; it's more experimenting. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.